He came down with them and stood on a level place with a great crowd of his disciples and a great multitude of people from all Judea, Jerusalem, and the coast of Tyre and Sidon. They had come to hear him and to be healed of their diseases. And those who were troubled with unclean spirits were cured. And all in the crowd were trying to touch him, for power came out from him and healed all of them. Then he looked up at his disciples and said, Blessed are you who are poor, for yours is the kingdom of God. Blessed are you who are hungry now, for you will be filled. Blessed are you, f are you who weep now, for you will laugh. Blessed are you when people hate you, and when they exclude you, revile you, and defame you on account of the Son of Man. Rejoice in that day, and leap for joy, for surely they will, your reward is great in heaven. For that is what their ancestor, ancestors did to the prophets. But woe to you who are rich, for you have received your consolation. Woe to you who are full now, for you will be hungry. Woe to you who are laughing now, for you will mourn and weep. Woe to you when all speak well of you, for that is what their ancestors did to the false prophets. The word of God for the people of God. Thank you, Nolan. Do any of you remember those old TV commercials when E.F. Hutton speaks, people listen? Anyone here remember that? <clears throat> now, the same can be said of Jesus. When Jesus spoke, people listened. And we see that time and time again because this is just one example of how Jesus gathered around him a large crowd to hear what he had to say. Now many of those people came there for healing. Many of those people came there to experience something that would make them whole. And yet, in that situation as in so many others, Jesus speaks. And when he does, I suspect you could have heard a pin drop. Here in Luke is one of those occasions where Jesus is speaking. He is standing in a level place. It's often been titled the Sermon on the Plain. Not to be confused with Matthew's account of the Sermon on the Mount. And yet there are some similarities here. Jesus is standing there and people have gathered in from all of Judea, from Jerusalem, even from the coastline of Tyre and Sidon. They've come a long way to hear what Jesus has to say. And this sermon, like the Sermon on the Mount in Matthew, begins with the Beatitudes and ends with a lesson about the builders. Very similar except this one's quite a bit shorter. And for our purposes here, I want to focus on just a portion of this sermon, a portion that includes both blessings and woes. Unlike Matthew, here in this account in Luke, only four Beatitudes are lifted up. Only four. Now, I learned a long time ago that when you're studying the Beatitudes, that there's always more than meets the eye. Every one of these Beatitudes goes much deeper than just what we see on the surface. And while it's absolutely true that Jesus would have spoke these words to encourage those who were poor or hungry, we discover in Matthew's Gospel when Jesus shared these same Beatitudes that it goes deeper than material poverty or physical hunger. Jesus spoke in the Sermon on the Mount about the poverty of spirit. In chapter 5, verse 3, and when He spoke of hunger, He spoke of hungering for righteousness 
there in Matthew 5, 6. In other words, the Beatitudes always carry with them a deeper meaning. Now there's no question that Jesus often ministered to the poor. He often ministered to those who were hungry. And for them, words like this had to be a great source of encouragement and uplifting to think that, as Claudia said, better days are coming. There will be a time when this will pass and you'll be in a much better place. And while Jesus often cared for those who were materially poor or hungry, He was also concerned about something else. And that is something that is spiritual, something that is deeper. He was concerned about the poverty of spirit because He wanted everyone He spoke to in these large crowds to really have a close relationship with God. And he knew that many of them in the crowd had at best a very shallow relationship with God. And in some cases, no relationship at all. But here's what we need to understand. It's when we recognize that we need or want our relationship with God to be better, deeper, more appreciated, more understood. It's when we recognize those things that the blessings begin to pour out and we know that the kingdom of God is ours. So whether you have little in this life or plenty in this life, Jesus wants us to be rich in things above. Amen. Rich in things above. And that's so important for us to understand. Then He spoke of hunger. And again, there had to be people in that crowd who were physically hungry. Maybe they hadn't had a decent meal in a long time. And He wanted to comfort them. But He also wanted to encourage everyone in that crowd to hunger for something more than just food. He wanted them to hunger for righteousness. And that's just a big word that means right living. Treating others as you would have them treat you. Loving your neighbor as yourself. That's what it's all about. That's what righteousness means. But here, Jesus is encouraging the people in that crowd to grow in their walk of faith. To seek God in every decision they make. To look to God time and time again and realize that God is there even when they mess up. God is there. Because while many things in this life bring a great deal of satisfaction to us, nothing brings a deeper sense of satisfaction than knowing that we love Jesus. Amen. Knowing that Jesus loves us. Knowing that we can serve, bless, serve God every day. That's when we're blessed. And Jesus doesn't stop there. He starts talking about weeping now. Saying that those who weep will one day laugh. I suspect every one of us in this life have been through some kind of a moment or some kind of a time or some kind of experience where we just had to break down and weep. Has that ever happened to you? Maybe more times than you dare count. But somehow, some way, 
in the course of time, those things pass and we find ourselves filled with joy again. And we find ourselves laughing again. In the early service this morning, I made a comment that uh, I've read that uh, laughter is good for the soul. It lifts our spirits, doesn't it? When was the last time you had a real belly laugh, as they call it? It's good for you. And if you want to laugh right now, go ahead. I'll give you time. <laughs> it's good for you. But here again, this powerful word goes much deeper than just the shedding of real tears. One thing I've learned over the years that when people get to that point in life where they're ready to repent, often that can be accompanied by a sense of sorrow. Often that can be accompanied by a sense of remorse. As we look back and we think, oh my goodness, how miserably I failed. How miserably I've let God down. And yet, hear the good news. When we turn to God and those tears come because of whatever's happened in the past, Hear the good news. God wipes the tears from our eyes immediately. And God replaces those tears with joy and laughter and peace and happiness. It doesn't get any better than that, folks. I love it because in one moment I can be so sorrowful, but then all of a sudden I realize that None of that junk in the past matters. None of it. Because God is never going to hold it against us ever again. Isn't that good news? That's what sets us free. That's where we experience this great depth of joy and the love of God. And yep, we might even laugh a little too. There's one more beatitude he lifts up, and this one, this one may be the hardest of all to understand. It's difficult because he says here, blessed are you when men hate you and you're excluded and insulted and called all kinds of evil things all for the sake of Christ. Now, how can you be blessed in something like that? Now, if it's any consolation, Jesus goes on to say, you're in good company. That's the way they treated the prophets. You're in good company. I like that. Doesn't help me much, but I like it. <laughs> Then perhaps Jesus shared these words as a means of encouraging us to keep the faith, to keep pressing on, to keep loving God, even when others try to discourage us. Even when others try to put us down because of our faith. I'll never forget one time a number of years ago, I was on an archaeological dig. You didn't know that about me, did you? You can just call me Indiana Grant. That's all right, you know. <laughs> just a few feet away from me were a couple of fellows, one of whom I knew. The other was his brother. I had never met him in my life. And when... Uh, when he found out that I was a preacher, he had to make a comment. He said, you Christians are all alike. 
Well, I said, that's nice. Well, what's that mean? <laughs> then he went on to say, you're all a bunch of hypocrites. I thanked him. <laughs> went on digging, and somehow in the back of my mind, I thought, I'm going to prove this guy wrong. Somehow I'm going to show him the love of God. I never saw the guy all that many more times, but every time I saw him, I greeted him warmly. I always had kind things to say. And I'll never forget one day he looked at me and said, you know, what in the world is it going to take to get you riled up? <laughs> What's it going to take to get you mad at me? I just looked at him and I said, you know what? You can say all you want. You can try to discourage me in my faith or whatever. And no, I'm not perfect and most of the people that I know aren't perfect. I only met one and I don't believe him. <laughs> <laughs> most of us aren't perfect. But that's okay. God loves us just the same. Isn't that good news? God loves us just the same. God still cares for us even when we're not perfect. And yeah, we may not always get it right. But thank God we have a God who will rein us back in, get us back on the right path, and keep us going forward. Jesus shared these words perhaps for more than any other reason to encourage the believers in the crowd to keep pressing on even when others tried to discourage them. Because He would go on to say that great is your reward in heaven. One day, one day, you are going to experience the fullness of all the fruits of your labor. Isn't that good news? We don't always see that here. We don't always see that. But one day, we're going to be met by all the people whose lives we touched and blessed in some way. And often in ways we didn't even realize at the time. And best of all, one day, when we all get to heaven, and I'm not getting the bus load up today, but when we all get to heaven, we're going to hear those immortal words, well done. And when we do, you talk about entering into joy. It'll be joy unimaginable. And for that, we have to give thanks to God. And so this day, I hope we learn something from these Beatitudes. They go much deeper than just the surface. But always remember that God's with us. God loves us. God cares for us. And God will not let us down. Amen. And so today, as I close out this message, if you're sitting there thinking, wow, I need a closer walk with God been a while since I've really talked to God. It's been a while since I really recognized that, yeah, I'm not perfect, but I still love Jesus, and Jesus loves me. If you just want to come and pray this morning and somehow allow God to touch your heart and help you to become whole in some way or another. Maybe it's been a long time since you've been able to laugh. God wants you to be able to do that. And so, let's take a moment in silence, and when we sing this closing hymn, come and pray.